so far we were looking at the operation of addition specifically but if you think about it there is nothing fundamentally that prevents us from generalizing this operation that we have out here right there is nothing that says we need to restrict ourselves only to the plus operation right we could perfectly well also have replaced it with subtraction multiplication division all kinds of arithmetic operations or what are called logical operations right so those of you who have already done a course on digital logic systems might recognize that there are terms like the xor function the or and and so on that would normally be called boolean logic apart from that there are also things like comparisons right is one number greater than another or less than another or equal to another those are also logical comparisons as we put them right and shifting right which is actually something which is very specific to how we implement or rather how we represent numbers inside a computer but is something that we will make fair amount of use of later right all of these are broadly classified as what are called logical operations apart from that there are other arithmetic operations possibly more complex ones square root cosine sine exponent transcendental functions right any any kind of things that we can think of basically not all computers are capable of all kinds of functions right and in fact typically what happens is that there are some bare minimum that we think of and say okay you know this has to be implemented otherwise the computer is not particularly useful but beyond that do we really have hardware for performing things like square roots and so on maybe maybe not in fact there are many computers that can't even do multiplication right why because we know that repeated addition can be used in order to implement multiplication so you don't strictly speaking need multiplication as one of the basic operations inside a computer right it can always be sort of emulated using other techniques so this set of operations right is by no means a requirement or even a complete set right there may be computers that are able to do only a subset of these there may be computers that are capable of doing more than what i have listed out here but the basic point that i want to make over here is this op that i had initially shown as a plus sign could be generalized right now of course the question then becomes okay what exactly does it mean generalize it right and what i have in mind over here is see after all this a and b the set of inputs were coming in from some memory blocks that is from somewhere outside and the point that i'm trying to make is why can't op as well come from somewhere else okay it need not be something that's hardwired into the hardware of the system it could be something that can be changed as we depending on the inputs that we want to deal with okay so the op values in other words may also end up coming from a memory block what that means is now suddenly if i have a sequence of operations that i want to perform right i have a1 and b1 and i want to add them together that's possible but a2 and b2 maybe i want to multiply them together a3 and b3 i want to xor them together and a4 i want to find its square root and at that point whatever was there in b4 maybe i just don't care what it was right so i could basically just ignore it i only want to use a4 okay so in this way already you can start to see how this starts to become useful right i can put a set of numbers in a another set of numbers in b and a set of operations into this op memory all i need is some kind of a counter that you know generates addresses for these values right keeps pulling them out one by one in sequence puts them through my hardware and generates a sequence of outputs that goes and gets stored in the s memory right so this is a generalization of the idea of computation it's saying that i'm no longer restricted to plus i can perform other kinds of computations as well this particular unit right because of what it does right we basically have arithmetic operations logical operations and well more arithmetic operations it's usually termed the arithmetic and logic unit or the alu right and this term alu is something that once again is going to be very common when we talk about what's happening inside a computer processor okay so the alu in other words is the one that actually performs computations 
right? Everything else about the computer is doing something else. The ALU is the one that actually performs the numerical computations, dealing with numbers. Okay, so the next thing that we want to look at, right? Now we have got an idea of, we are slowly starting to build up a picture of what this computer looks like. And what we have is this blob in the middle, which I'm just representing with a circle, which now we have a name for it. It's the ALU, right? What do we do with that ALU? We need to be able to provide it with inputs A and B, right? You might be thinking, okay, you know, why did I restrict myself to two input values? Maybe I want to do A plus B plus C, right? Sure, you could potentially have an ALU that takes three inputs as well, right? For now, we are just keeping it simple. And in fact, there may even be computers that actually work with ALUs that have three inputs or even more than that, right? But the bottom line is that doesn't really gain anything fundamentally because any operation of three inputs can be broken up two at a time, right? So usually what happens is that we do the operations two at a time, which is why I have also taken the option of just working with two inputs for the ALU out here. The actual instructions or, you know, the work that needs to be performed by the ALU is coming from another memory block where I store the op values. And finally, the result of that goes into yet another memory block that I've labeled S out here, okay? Let's take a closer look at this. Why not just put everything together into one big memory block, right? There's really no fundamental reason out here why a and B and the op and the S needed to be in four separate physical memory blocks, right? Instead, what I could think of is one big block out here, right? Where I know that if my address is something out here in this range, right? Whatever, maybe there's some index, some tag, some number that basically represent what these addresses correspond to, right? The value that comes out over here corresponds to A the A value of whatever the ALU is looking for, right? Another set of values out here could correspond to basically the values in B. There could be yet another set of values out here that give me the operation to be performed. And finally, there is something that comes back from the ALU and gets stored into yet another set of memories or memory locations, right? Memory addresses. And that part I just label as S. So, in other words, logically, all of this looks more or less the same. It's a place where I can store data and if I want to read something from it, I can get back data. Where do I look for what kind of information, right? That has to be known. I can't just blindly go in there and assume that I know exactly what's going on. This information about where is A, where is B, where is the, where are the operations, where are the results to be stored is what's usually called the address map, okay? And it's not obvious what the address map should be. This is highly application dependent, right? So as and when I build up a computer, I need to know what kind of address map I'm constructing, right? Of course, if I'm building the computer, I have control over it. So I can choose where to put A, where to put B, where to put operations and so on, okay? If somebody else built the computer for me, they'll probably give me some specific guidelines saying, hey, put your operations over here. This is where you store your data, right? And maybe a couple of restrictions of that sort, right? Which I need to follow. Now, let's go one step further, right? This is the same diagram as what was there in the previous picture. By the way, you might notice that, you know, down here I have this small blob that I have marked with a question mark, right? You might be wondering why that's even there, right? Why not just use my memory for the A, B, op and S? Well, what if I have used up all my A, B, op and S and I don't have anything further to put over there? It's not always necessary that, you know, whatever operations I, whatever data and operations I want has to fill up all my memory. So for now, all that this is saying is, hey, my memory could be larger than, you know, what is strictly speaking required, okay? And what do I put into the rest of it? That's up to me, right? Good, we'll need to think about that later when we actually start understanding memory management because which is one of the key issues as far as the C programming language. Okay, so now let's look at this picture once again. What we have over here is the A, B and the S 
right? So A and B being inputs and S being the output are what we would normally refer to as data. Usually numbers, but potentially they could even be other things. They could be data, they could be what we think of as strings, names, words, English, right? Some logical data, anything of that sort, okay? The point is A, B and S by themselves don't tell the computer what to do. They only are used by the computer to do some work. Op, on the other hand, is precisely for that. It is to tell the computer what to do at each stage, right? Should I add two numbers together? Should I multiply them? Should I compare them? Should I take a square root, right? All that is contained in op, okay? So we usually refer to that as a set of instructions. So you can see in this picture over here that I have some space set apart for the data, some space set apart for the instructions. Was that really necessary? I could have just mixed everything together, right? I could potentially at least think of a scenario where I have some data in one memory location, I have data in the next memory location, the third memory location is an operation. The fourth one need not be the place to store the result, it could be some other data. Fifth one could be another operation, right? This is a little confusing, right? So it's not necessarily a good thing to do it. All I'm saying is it's possible, right? And the point I want to make over here is all of these things, the data that I have are numbers that are finally represented as bits. The operations can also be represented in the form of bits, right? And how is that? I, I just basically associate some kind of a code I say that maybe the code 1 corresponds to addition, code 2 corresponds to subtraction, code 3 corresponds to multiplication and so on. So all I have is, I have once again taken my operations which I normally use a symbol for when I am writing it down, convert it to a number, convert that number into bits, put it into memory, right? And what I have is some kind of a mixed memory that can store both instructions as well as data, right? And this was one of the key insights that led to this concept of what's called the stored program computer, right? Essentially what it says is you have a certain block of memory, use that in order to store the program that is going to drive the computer. And interestingly enough, I can use that same block of memory also to store the data that the computer is going to work on, okay? Now, like I said, this mixed memory is possible, that doesn't necessarily mean it's a good idea, right? Why? Well, it looks much simpler and cleaner to sort of collect all my instructions and put them together in one place, right? And say basically, okay, these are the kinds of operations that you need to perform, op1, op2, op3 and so on, right? So it becomes sort of very logically clear. I just look at the memory and I know that this block corresponds to the code, right? And that, at the end of the day, is finally what we will be calling the program, okay? So I'm able to sort of take all my operations, my instructions, group them together and say, okay, this is a program. It is a set of values that is sitting in memory, right? Each of those values is some kind of a code, right? It's a tag or an index or some kind of assignment that basically says, this particular number, if it is found in memory, corresponds to addition. This corresponds to subtraction. This corresponds to division, right? That is in some sense why it's called a code, right? We don't say a code, we usually say code, right? The term for it that we will normally be using moving forward is to say that this is the program. It's a sequence of instructions, right? Which the computer is able to interpret, right? The computer it understands, I mean, that word understand is used very loosely over here, right? What it actually means is when the computer encounters that particular sequence of bits, the gates and the logic circuitry within it automatically make it perform some kind of operation. Okay. In the same way, logically, I can also group all my data together, right? And say that, yes, I have a certain part of my memory that's allocated for storing data, okay? 
Now where this gets actually interesting as we will see later is now you can see that you know I have taken away I have sort of broken the distinction between A and B and S. Previously they were all three different memory blocks. Now I am saying they are all data. Okay. The interesting thing with that approach is of course I can do A1 plus B1 and store the result in S1. But I can potentially think of my next instruction as saying okay you know take S1 as one of the inputs take the next value as another input, perform the operation and then write the result somewhere else or maybe even write the result back into where a1 was. Okay, So I have suddenly got this sort of flexibility that a, b and s are no longer logically different. They are all in the same chunk of memory. How exactly I work with them is now up to me. We will be making a lot of use of that moving forward. Now coming back to this blob at the bottom out here, right? what could I put in over there? One answer of course is other programs, some other code and the corresponding data. right? And yes, most of the time what happens is that when I have some memory associated with my computer, I find that most of that memory is basically divided up into chunks and there are many programs that are running in it more or less at the same time. Right? And this idea of what exactly do we mean by at the same time is something that we need to think about and understand a little bit better. Right? But there is another important use of this memory space that I have out here, right? which is for the use of something called peripherals. Once again, something that we will be looking at in a lot more detail as we move forward. Okay? So this kind of arrangement out here where I have the code sort of grouped together and the data grouped together grouped into another bunch is typical, right? it is common and that is more or less how most programs are constructed. 